Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, so today we are going to be doing basically a guided build of a feedback form um, using Anvil. And Anvil is a platform for making web apps, for building web apps with nothing but Python. So traditionally, web will involve a lot of JavaScripts, HTML, CSS. Um, with Anvil, you don't need to do that. You've got Python on the front end, Python on the back end. Um, and it's a little hard to describe exactly what it is. Um, in the sense of it does, you can do almost anything with Anvil, just like you can with Python. Um, and so therefore the best way to understand what Anvil is to, is to use it. And that's what we're gonna be doing. So what I have, and I'm just dropping the link in the chat now, is a PDF that will take us through the guided build that we're gonna do. Um, and what you're seeing on my screen is just the, um, what you see when you go to the building, the, the, the sort of landing page for building an app with Anvil. Um, and you can just uh, create a free account with Anvil. It's there's no, um, it's free forever. There's no like, you know, oh, you only have a certain amount free and then you have to stop paying. So don't worry about that. And we're gonna be, yeah, walking through that tutorial and we'll see how far we get. Please feel free to unmute and ask questions at any point. The idea is that um, by being here, you should be able to get some of the benefit of, of me being here and this being a guided build more so than just, you know, you're watching a video of me doing it. So um, I am here to help debug people who are um, build, build people's problems who are building alongside. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I've, I've dropped the link um, and I'll give everyone a couple of minutes to, if they are going to build alongside or if you just wanna sit back and watch, then that's also absolutely fine, of course. Um, get set up with their account. There's very little you actually need to do. Um, and maybe take a skim through the PDF if they'd like to. And yeah, um, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. So what I'll do is I'll give everyone a couple minutes and then I'll message when I think we're going to be ready to get started. And please ask questions in the meantime. All right, I'm going to get started. Um, please shout now in the chat if you want another couple of minutes or if you would like, if um, you know, speak now or I will get going. Cool, okay, so step zero, which is what we're on right now is going to the landing page for building an app with Anvil. And you can see that that's what I've got here on my screen now. Um, we're doing this build in our new beta editor because it's gorgeous and so much better than the classic editor. And it's almost out of beta to be honest. Um, and what we're going to do to start is you can see on the left, on the right here, I've got a bunch of different apps that I've built before because um, as a developer advocate for Apple, I've built a lot of them. I'm going to be creating a new blank app. And once you click on that, it brings up this dialogue that gives you a bunch of different themes to choose between. Um, we're going to go with material design. And this takes us to a new app. Um, and what you can see here is essentially this bit in the center is a web page or what your web page will look like. On the right, you have a bunch of components. Um, and these are things that you can drag and drop onto this page to create your UI. And on the left here, you have um, uh, various different aspects of building an app. So you've got things like, if you wanna have databases to go alongside it, you can edit the theme and this is your app structure. So what we're looking at here is a form and that is what um, comprises the front end of your app. And so you can see it's under client code. We don't have any server code yet, but we'll get to that. So we are on step one at the moment. Um, and what we're going to do to start is we're actually just going to publish the app um, straight up from, um, you know, we don't have to do anything yet, uh, anything in order for it to become live on the web. Essentially, I'm going to rename my app and I'm going to call it feedback form because that's what we're building. Um, and app title here is what happened is what gets displayed in the tab. So I'm going to also call that feedback form and an app description. And that's what would come up if you were looking for that app on a uh, search engine or something. Cool. Now that's all saved. And what I'm going to do now is select publish in the top right. I'm just going to move this. Um, so you hit, got this big publish button here. And if you bring that up, it asks you, would you like to just publish this app to the web? And it brings up another dialogue. It's auto filled for me a bunch of random words. 
um, I can actually change that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename that Eli's feedback form. Um, I'm actually going to call it Eli's code bar feedback form just to disambiguate. And I'm going to save that. And what I'm actually going to do now is if I go to this uh, link, um, my app is very blank right now. We haven't done anything with it, but that is now live on the web. Anybody could go to your app and see it. So we have now um, <laughs> published a, a web app. Uh, it doesn't do anything yet, but that's what we're going to get started on. Um, oh, sorry, that was all step zero. We are now on step one. Um, please uh, shout in the chat if you if I'm going too fast or if you'd like to slow down, if you have any questions. Um, right. So we have published our app. It is now live on the web. Um, what we'd like it to do is uh, have some function. So we're going to go back to this form. And we've already uh, sort of run through what this editor is. Um, and to start, we're just going to start building the front end of our app. Here, I'm going to select a, a label component. And this is just text. It's basically like a, a paragraph um, in HTML language. But we don't need to know about any of that. So um, I'm going to drag and drop that. And what you can see is on the on the right here, um, because it's a selected component, it's brought up all of its properties and it has a name. And this is the name by which you'll be able to access it through Python code on the front end. Um, and it's got lots of properties. So things like this text here, I could make it bold if I wanted to. I haven't set its text property yet, but um, what we're going to set it to is just set it to feedback form. And you can see as I type in here, it comes up here. And if I go to Eli's code bar feedback form, um, we can see that that's now reflected in, in the sort of live web uh, version of that that anyone can access. Um, right. So that is essentially the, the basics of building a front end with Anvil as you drag and drop components onto your form, onto your page, and you can edit their properties um, through the UI here, um, but you can also edit them in code, um, which we'll be seeing in a little bit later. Uh, so now we're on step 1.2, which is adding some slightly more useful components um, to our form, such as user input. So what I'm going to do is drag a card component, which is just a display thing. It gives us this nice little raised, raised um, backdrop. And I'm going to add some text box to my, uh, to my app so that people who use it can type in text and then we can start using it to collect feedback um, on uh, sort of, uh, yeah, whatever it is that you would like to use a feedback form for. So I've dragged a text box onto my app um, and I'd actually like to rename this. Um, I would like to rename this to name box because what it's going to take is as an input is people are going to type their names into it so that we can know who has given us feedback. So I'm going to call it name box. And the reason I gave this one a name property and not the label that we put as the title is because this one we actually are going to want to access through code. The other one we don't really need to access through code. So I've renamed it and I'm going to give it some placeholder text. And the placeholder text is going to be enter your name here. Um, just to completely make it clear to the user that that's what they're supposed to do with this box. Um, I'm going to drag another label over to sit next to it. So just go back to adding a new component and put that here. And there you go. And I'm going to do the same thing just below for um, an email address. So that's another text box. I'm going to rename this to email box. And similarly to before, enter your email address it would help if I could spell email address here and similarly I'm going to add a label on the left to match there we go um, and if we want to this isn't actually in the pdf but what we can do is you see this little blue I don't know if you I don't know if it's actually showing up on the screen share but if I'm hovering over the text labels or the text boxes, you can see there's a sort of blue delineator in the middle. And I can actually, um, if I click on the card, I can 
access that and drag things over so that there is uh, the text boxes are larger and the labels are shorter because they don't need that much space. We'd like to be able to emphasize the text boxes. Cool. Um, so we've entered some UI. Um, and if we go back and check what it looks like on uh, the version of this, I'm just going to refresh. We can see that this is now reflected. I'm going to make this a little larger so that it's clear. Um, and I can I can type some text in here. There's nothing, you know, there's nowhere for that text to go. We haven't added any way for that to be useful yet, but it exists. Um, we're now going to add a way for people to add their actual feedback. So very similarly to before, we're going to add uh, an input element. But instead of the text box, which is quite small and a little bit, it's not it's not really suitable for large amounts of text. Someone might want to leave a really lengthy review of whatever it is that we're asking for feedback on. We're going to add a text area, which is the one that looks like this. You can see it's got two lines of, of text within it. I'm going to drag that onto the page. And one thing we can do as well is I'm just moving my Zoom windows around. Um, this blue box at the bottom, we can actually drag that um, to make this text area as large as we like. And I'm going to rename this component as we did with the text boxes so that it's easy to access through code or it's got a clear variable name. Feedback area. There we go. And I'm going to add some placeholder text. Enter your feedback here. Oh, I didn't make it clear earlier. Placeholder text is, you'll see it all the time in web forms, text that um, input uh, elements like this are often it's often pre-filled with but that will disappear as soon as you start typing if we did want to put text in here that was the same kind of text as users would input we do actually have an option to do that with this text property but we don't want that we want all of the text property to be input by the user so we're not going to use that in this case um, and I'm also going to add one more label just to make it extra clear that this box is where they should be putting their feedback um, feedback there we go cool and again going to this refreshing we can see that that's been reflected and now this looks like a real ui that we've built um however nothing is going to happen with all of this stuff there's not even any way for somebody to tell me that they have um added feedback so what we're going to do is we're going to drag a button component um and we're going to put that slap bang in the middle at the bottom and I'm just gonna change. So there's a bunch of different uh, sort of appearance related things that you can do to make things look a little bit nicer. One of them is roles in Anvil, which is a way to um, use CSS, CSS rather, but you don't have to, but there are some that are built into the material design and I'm gonna call, I'm gonna do primary color um, as this role. And you can see that that's just changed it. If I go back to the default, you can see it's changed it from that white background and blue text, just to having um, a blue background and white text. Uh, all right, and I am going to change its name just to button because we're only going to have one of them. It doesn't need to have a number. And instead of text, the text being just button one, I'm going to say submit feedback. All right. Um, right, there we go. Um, so now we have built a UI. And if I refresh, we can see that there is that button at the bottom and I could type in my name, I could type in my address. Um, and I can type something in there and we can hit that button, but it doesn't do anything. We didn't write any code to do anything with these inputs yet. So that will be the next step is taking those inputs that people will can put into the code, into the app rather, and storing them somewhere. Uh, in order to do that, we will need a database in our app. And the way that we can add that is by going onto the left here. And of all of these things, this is app structure. And you can see I've just got my form, nothing else here. Um, there's some uh, visual stuff. So there's, here's the HTML for the page, the CSS. You don't need to know anything about that. Um, and what we want is we want data. And we don't have any databases yet. We haven't added one. So I'm going to add a table. And that takes us to um, our new data table that we have added. And I'm going to rename it. What I'm going to do is I want to call it feedback. And if I do that, I'm just going to also rename it in here as well. So what I did, oh, um, resolve differences. It's telling me that it's uh, 
yeah it's telling me that I changed the name I should have done that first before changing its python name but here we go um what I did there was change the name doesn't seem to have taken uh that's correct hang on yep oh my goodness okay never mind about that <laughs> Sorry, as I said, this is still a beta editor and that is one of the ugly corners. We don't actually need to rename it here. The important thing is that we've renamed it over here. And what that does, if I can unhighlight it, there we go. Um, you can see it says that it's its Python name. And this means that when we access the database through code, uh, it, we are um, defining what variable name it's gonna have. Um, and we'll see this in a little bit, but I have, I have called this database feedback and that's what we're gonna, uh, its name is in Python is going to be. So um, we have a database. It doesn't have um, a schema yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a way, we're going to add space to store the input that we get from our users. And we've taken three pieces of input from them. We've taken a name, an email, and their feedback. So we want to add a new column and we want to add a text column. Um, and this text column is going to store their name. Similarly, we can do exactly the same for email um, and we can do the same again for their feedback all right one other thing we're going to do is we're going to take a note of when they hit that submit button um, so what we're going to do is we've got three text columns uh three, yeah three text columns here but we're going to add a column of a different type um, we're going to add a date and time column and that is a column that is designed to store timestamp objects essentially so we'll add that and we will call that timestamp. Um, so now we have a database all set up, ready to accept data that we collect from our users. Um, and the way that we access this data table is by writing some code on the server. So um, a little bit of background, I don't know what um, sort of what everyone's familiarity with writing web, writing for the web is, but um, at a very basic level, you have a server somewhere that's running code that's um, quite secure People can't, uh, people can't access that, users can't access it. It's very safe to write functions there that deal with um, sensitive information that you don't want to leak out. Um, and then you also have a browser somewhere usually that's running client code. And this code, um, in theory, anybody with access to that browser and dev tools like the, the dev console in Chrome, for example, could access the code that you've written and extract information from it. So you want to be quite careful about what you allow into your client code for security reasons. And then that client and that server will talk to each other. Um, so when we're dealing with things like our databases, we generally want to keep that sort of thing on the server because we don't want anybody who's accessing our app to be able to access our database because it might contain sensitive information. We don't want them to be able to read it, all the feedback that everybody's ever given potentially. Um, so we're gonna write some server code to deal with our database. And the way that we write server code in an Anvil app, and this server code, because we're using the hosted Anvil service, will run on um, a machine that Anvil controls in the cloud. Um, so we will go to add a server module. And now we have some code. And this is a full Python environment. Um, we're only gonna be using the standard library for everything that we do, um, because this feedback form tutorial is designed to be able to be run without having to um, have a paid account. So we can just use the standard library for that. Um, right, so we're adding some server code. So we want to write a function that is going to take the data that our users input and put it into that data table. And the way that we're gonna access our data table through code is this, this line here, um, importing app tables. And this app tables um, might look a little bit familiar because if we go back to the tab where our data table was, you can see that that's here, app tables, and then app tables .feedback refers to this database. So if I do, I'm going to define a new function and I'm gonna call it add feedback. And this is gonna take some inputs, right? Because we've taken inputs, we, we've got things that we want to add into our data table. And those things are a name, an email, a feed and some feedback. Um, all right. And what I want to do with this piece of information is I want to put it in my data table. So to do that, I do app tables 
dot feedback and you can see it's already auto completing for us in um, the this interpreter knows that we have a data table called feedback and it will auto complete for us and what we want to do is we want to add a row and the, the values that we're going to add our name is the name that we're inputting into this function similarly for the email and the feedback is going to be um, the feedback that we input into this function cool um, so we've added a new row um, one other thing that we'd like to do is we'd like to add some date, um, some timestamp information into that new row of our data table because we've made space for it. We'd like to record it. So in order to do that, um, we need to import date time, which is how you do timestamps in Python. So from date time, import date time. There we go. And to keep a record of when this new piece of information was added into our data table, we're just going to have timestamp is date time not now and that just gives us a timestamp of this is when this happened all right and so we've written this function um, i'm just going to make it look a little bit nicer if i can um and we've written this function and what this does is this takes some input and puts it into our data tables but we actually need to call this function from somewhere with what was given to us in the ui so we need to make this function callable from our client code and the way that we do that in anvil is we add a decorator at the top um, and we say i want this function to be callable from client code so we have now written a function um, that can be called from a client code so let's go and do that and to do that we're going to write we're going to go back to our form which is what runs on the client and we've got our design here and then we're just going to go to the code view i'm going to do that so we've got a little bit more space um, Folks, please, please message me in the chat if I'm going too fast. I feel like I'm rocketing through this. And if anybody has any questions, I would be more than happy to clarify things before anybody gets too lost. Um, right, we have client code here. This is Python code that runs in the browser when your form is loaded. When somebody visits your app and loads this form, which is the form that they see when they first visit your app, um, this code gets run. And what happens is that form is initialized. And you can see that there's a, an init here, standard Python. And all that it currently does by default is it goes through all the components that are on that page. So like the text box, the button, all of that stuff. And it initializes those. Um, what we actually want to do is we want something to happen when that button is clicked, that, that self button here. And you can see on the right, there's a list, there's lists here of all of the things that we dragged and dropped onto that page. So you can see self email box here. Um, that's one of the text boxes and you can see it's got the name in Python. It's an attribute of the form itself. That's what self refers to as the form. Um, and if we actually expand here, we can see that that text box has a load of properties that we want to be able to act or we would like to be able to access. Um, and so there's, we're gonna be using some of these um, in order to, make our feedback form do what we want it to do. So what we actually want to do, as I said, is make that button do something. So the way that we do that is we're going back to the design and we're going to go and select that button in our UI when we build it. And we've brought up its properties here on the right, scroll all the way down to the bottom. And we can see that this button has particular events that can be associated with it. What we want is we want something to happen when that button is clicked. So let's click on, let's uh, hit this one here, hit this button. And what this has done is this has created a new function for us in our forms code. And that button, that this function will be run when the button is clicked. So just to test this out, we're gonna call an alert and I'm just gonna make it say, hello. Um, obviously we're gonna make this function do something a lot more a lot more useful and complicated in a moment, but just to illustrate what's going on here. Um, if I go back to the, the live published version of this app, just refresh it. And now if I click this button, it brings up an alert. So that is the result of calling that code in the client that we wrote to call an alert. We can see that clicking that button now actually runs that code. Cool. What we actually want to do when this button is clicked is we want to call that server function that we wrote in order to input data into our database and we want to take the inputs that a user will have written into the text boxes in that text area we want to take that 
pass it to the server and let the server put it into the database. And in order to do that, what we do is we call that server function. Now you can't call it directly because it's a, this, is, this is client code and we want to call a function on the server. So it's not as simple as just typing the function name, but what we do instead is we do an app, we do anvil server call, and you can see it's trying to autofill here the name of the function that we've written. And the interpreter knows that this is a server function that can be called from the client because we added that little decorator on the top of it. And we call that, but this function also takes some inputs. And the way that you do that in a server call with Anvil is you add them as positional arguments afterwards. Oh, that's not what I wanted at all. So we want to add a name. Oh, that's not what I wanted at all either. Sorry. Um, we want to add a name. We want to add an email, some email information, and we want to add um, the feedback. Now, of course, we don't have any variables called name, email, and feedback. We want to extract them from what's been put into the UI. And to do that, we're going to need to access those text boxes and that text area through code. But we already set it up so that it's going to be easy to do that. We gave them really obvious variable names. So the way that we get the text that has been put into that name box is we get we access that name box and we access its variable of text. And what this does is it pulls out whatever somebody's typed into that text box and gives it to us as a string. Same for email, self email box text. And just again, self feedback area, that's what we called it. And exactly the same as for a text box, you should access its text property. And so what this function is doing is it's calling that server code that we wrote before, that server function, um, and yeah, we're calling the server, telling it run this function and give it this, these variables as its inputs. Um, and once that's done, we're gonna wanna let the user know that something's happened. So we'll do an alert, but we'll actually make it say something more useful than just hello. And what have I put in the, yeah, there we go. Thank you for your feedback is what I put in the tutorial. And we might as well follow that as accurately as possible. Thank you for your feedback. Um, even if they might have sent us a really horrible message about how whatever it was was terrible and we should go out of business. Um, right. So we have now written some client code and we've written some server code and we have a database to store the results of all those things we think the function should do. So let's give it a go. Um, it's worth noting also that you right now if this works, you can go to Eli's code by feedback form and submit your own feedback and I will be able to see it on in my data table. But first let me, you know, I'll do some just so we know that something's happened. Um, here we go. And if I submit this feedback now, oh, I didn't refresh it. Okay, if you don't refresh it, the new changes that, uh, I, that you write won't take effect, which makes sense. Um, And I'm going to click this button here. And it says, thank you for your feedback. Right, now, if I go back to my app and I go to my data table, oh my goodness, everything is so big. Here we go. And I just refresh. We can see that that input that I put in through the public app has now come through to my data table. And I have that. And you can see that the timestamp has been correctly recorded as 634 today, local time where I am at least. So that took, okay, let's call it half an hour um, for me to write and deploy a functioning web app that I can direct people to and say, hey, can you give me feedback on this, this code bar tutorial that I ran um, with an email if you would like me to be able to contact you again? Um, and I can collect that data into a data table. So, um, and if I wasn't talking through at the same time, it would take 10 minutes tops. So full stack web app in 10 minutes. Of course, that is not all you can do with your app, but this is the point at which it's actually become a useful piece of, uh, a useful thing that somebody's built. Um, right. Um, what I would like to do at this point is just put out another call for questions. Uh, people, please tell me how you are doing, if you are building along, if you are just here for, to watch me do it. Um, any thoughts? Yeah, I spoke a question. Um, with the databases, 
Is it possible yeah. to link it to like an external one or do people normally yes. use the one? Um, so what I, um, let me grab up the docs. So, uh, oh my gosh, everything's so large. I've zoomed in on my web page so that, um, so data and data tables and whereas external databases. So what you can do is obviously from server code, it's just, it's just a server. So yeah. if you want to use something like a MySQL database, so you've got an external Postgres or something, you can import whatever module you like um, if we've got it on our hosted servers um, and you can just connect to, to your own if you'd like to. Um, so for example, we've got quite a few users who have built a Django backend and then actually want, quite want to use an Anvil frontend. Um, and this is, might be how they'd like to do it. One thing I would like to say about that is that um, it would rely on a module that is not part of the standard library and on the on the free plan, you don't have access to that. Um, you have to be on the individual plan and above. If you are, then there's a squillion packages that are installed by default on our server modules on our on our in our server environments. Um, but if you want to do this for free, what you can do is you can also um, use local code and connect that up to your app using something called the uplink, which is very cool. Um, and I will happily answer questions about, but I feel like I've got a little off topic, but essentially the Anvil server is just a server and you can do yeah. anything that you would normally do with server code. The data tables are nice because they are built in and you just access them sort of really easily semantically from that Python code. Um, and they're a little bit, they're not, they're not faster per se, but there are lots of nice sort of built in methods um, for passing yeah. them between the, uh, server and client. Um, yeah, is that does, right. does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, awesome. Thank you. No worries. Cool. Um, all right. I guess we'll continue on with this uh, this build. Um, so the next thing that um, is in this guided build is sending emails from your app. So on the free plan any emails that your app sends will default back to being sent to you, the email address that you use to sign up for your Anvil account. Um, and this is to prevent people um, signing up for the free plan and then using Anvil to just like spam people. But um, all that we're gonna do as part of this guided build is we only wanna send emails to ourselves anyway, because what we want to do is we want to send an email whenever somebody adds feedback. Um, so what I'm gonna do is every time somebody submits a, a piece of feedback, um, I want it to email me. Um, and the way that I'm going to do that is I'm actually going to make, uh, I think this is slightly different from uh, the way that it's written in the, in the thing, but it's just, I'm going to do a, a separate function, def send email. Um, oh, actually, no, I'm going to do, I am going to do it directly in this function. Anyway, um, what I want to do is I want, yeah, I'm going to make it send me an email. Um, and this opens uh, opens me up to getting lots of spam from you folks. If you want to go to the published web app and you want to, now it'll send me an email as well as going into the data table. So use this power wisely. In order to do that, what I'm going to do is I need to add the email service to my app. So you go here, this blue, oops, sorry, this blue plus on the left is for adding extra services to your app. Some of these are paid features, not you know, most of them, there is some free version. Um, and with the email, um, service, which I'm going to add. So we've got things like user management, which we'll look at a bit later, the uplink, which I managed, uh, which I mentioned earlier for connecting locally running code or external code um, as a server environment, lots of different things. Email, that's what we're doing. Um, and you can see there's a bunch of different um, options here. You don't need to know much about any of them. Um, I have a squillion emails because I've got a paid account and so on, but um, it should say something like zero emails or zero um, external emails if you're on the free account. And that reflects the fact that you can't send them to any email address other than your own. Um, we don't need to mess with any of this. All that adding it does is it goes to, when in our server module, um, you can see that there's import Anvil email. Um, and we're gonna start using that. All I want to do is I want to send an email. Um, starting to not sound like a real word. Anvil email send. And I'm going to send it. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Sorry, I'm on my laptop, so I'm just typing like um, somebody who doesn't know how to type. Um, I'm going to send it to me. And 
I'm going to give it a subject. I am copying directly from the PDF at this point. Um, uh, here we go. And the subject is obviously what the subject of the email is going to be. And I'm going to make it an F string because I want to include the name of the person um, who has sent it. And mm, I am going to have the, the body of the email. And this can be um, HTML if you really want to, but I'm very lazy, so I'm not going to be doing that at all. Uh, I'm going to make it an F string. There we go. And a new person has given feedback. Um, uh, there we go. Name. And this is just sort of standard F string stuff. I will sort out that formatting in a moment. <laughs> um, and and it's worth noting that all of these um, variables that we're dealing with here, they're all strings. This is all safe. There's no potential for code injection at any point here. This is all going to be escaped and everything. So you don't need to worry about um, sort of yeah any of that potential stuff, which is nice because I'm anxious and I do worry about it. Cool. Right. It seems to be happy with all of that syntax. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my form on my app. I'm going to refresh it and I'm going to send an email to myself and enter my feedback here. This should get emailed. And you're going to get a look at my inbox. Is it going to come through? Yeah, here we go. Feedback from Eli with one too many capitals in it. Um, so we have sent email with our app now, which is quite cool. Um, and yeah, on there are many reasons you might want to do this. You might want, for example, every time a particular bug, you, maybe you've got a, a bug that you know about or some, some condition has been met and you've got to try accept. You might want to get an email every time that code path is run through. Um, you might want an email with a roundup of results every week or something. Um, yeah. Uh, awesome. Um, right, I am actually going to comment this out for now um, because I would rather keep my email inbox moderately clear. Uh, that's not going to work, is it? Um, can I do? No. OK, well, it's gone now. <laughs> cool. That's how to send emails, um, and that is all completely within the PDF that I sent to you. So if you really want to do that, you can do that, but I'm not going to have it in this live app. Um, cool. OK. Um, from here, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to add a second page to our web app in order to display feedback that we have got from our, our users. Um, and the way we're going to do that is we have our form one that we've, we've got here, and I'm looking at it in the split view here. I'm just going to look at it in design. Um, we don't want to use this to display the feedback that we have. We want to display it in a separate form because it will look nicer and we don't want to jumble too many things into one. So the way to do that is we go into our app structure and there's this button here called add form and that's going to add a new page and sort of similar to when we started our app, it's going to give us some options. Um, you can, there's various things that you might want to do for all, all we want to do is we want to have another page that's basically the same. So we're going to select standard page and this is called form two. You can rename these to be more useful names. We don't really need to for now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag a new label on to be the title. Um, and I'm going to call this um, received feedback. feedback. There we go. Um, all right, so we have two forms now, and the second one is very bare, as our first one was when we started out. What we want to be able to do is we want to be able to navigate between these two forms, because when we go to our published app, just refresh here, um, there's no way for a user to see that second form at the moment. We want to be able to, for them to click a button and move to it. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to go back to our form one, and we're going to add... A, a link component, I think is what I have in, yeah, a link component. And we're going to drag that onto here. And there's this little box here that's designed for things like that. And what we've got is we've got a link. And this is a component that 
it does something when you click on it, but it's different than a button and it has a built in URL component. So if you wanted to this to link to Wikipedia, another website, whatever, you could do that. We're not going to do that. We're actually going to, I'm going to give it some text and I'm going to go say, see feedback. And what I'm going to do is much like with the button, I'm going to scroll all the way down and add a click event to it or a, an event handler so that when we click on it, some code will run. And I do that. It takes us to the code view for our form. And um, you can see here above is the code that we wrote for clicking the button. All we want to do when this link is clicked is we want to open our new form. And what we do with, for that is there's a built in called open form. And you can see it autofills with the forms that we have. And we want to open form two. Cool. So if I go back to my published app, refresh, that link now exists and I can click on it. And it takes me to that new, very boring form that we've now built. Um, and I'm just going to go and do the exact same on this form that, so that it can take us back to the form one. And that is exactly what you might expect. You go and we drag a link here. I give it some text give feedback because that's what the other form does for us add a click event and exactly as before i want to open form but in this case what i want it to open is form one so the other one and now let me go back to that um i can go and see feedback and i can return it's pretty cool um and one neat thing is if i give it a name and i go to see feedback and i go back to give feedback it has wiped it um so there we go um so now we have a new form and we have added navigation between the two um our new form is pretty boring we'd like to display the feedback that we've already got from people on it and to do that we're going to need to retrieve all the data from our database and pass it all the way back up to the client to be displayed so in order to do that we will need to write a server code so we go back to our server module and now we're going to write a new um, function which will be callable from the client. So we've got one to add feedback, we want one to retrieve feedback. So Anvil server callable. And I'm going to call it get feedback. And this doesn't need to take any inputs. It's just you just call it and you get all of the feedback from the table. And the way that we do that, it's a one liner. We just want to return all of the data from our data table that we have. So and the way we access that is app tables feedback. And the function we want to call on it is just search, oh, search with um, with no uh, conditions. You can do searching for a particular name, or you could do searching for you know any. There's lots of different query operators that you can add in here. We want everything, so we're just going to do a blind, like just just a search. Um, cool. We can now call this function from the client to get all the data that exists in our data tables, um, and. As of right now, we only have the things that I've submitted, but that will be enough to show us that it's working. So we want to be calling this function from the form where we want to display all that feedback, which is form two. And we want something to some kind of structure on our page to display that in. Um, and the way that we, the, the component that's sort of designed for that purpose is called a data grid. And it's actually super handy. Um, it is this one here. And so I'm just gonna drag and drop this onto the page and it looks a bit horrific to start with. Um, what we actually are gonna do is we are gonna set it up to just accept um, the kind of data from our database. We're gonna set it up to accept that, um, that model, that, 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 that schema. Um, so we don't have enough columns right now. We have four columns in our data table and we've only got three in this grid. So all we're going to do is we're going to add another column and then we can get to renaming them. So this is going to be name. This is going to be email. This one is going to be, this one we're actually going to make be the timestamp. I know that's not the order that they, the columns are within our data table. The timestamp is actually at the end, doesn't matter. Um, and then we're going to have the feedback because we want the feedback to be all the way on the end. We want to give it loads of space because it could be a whole wall of text. You don't know what people have been saying about the thing that you're giving feedback on. Um, so um, 
oh sorry no i've realized that we've uh sorry i'm i'm out of date um this is not this is no longer the easiest way to do what we want to do with the data grid ignore everything i just said i'm going to delete all of these columns um so now we have we have a data grid with no columns in it and the really cool thing we can do now this is new in the beta editor which is why i forgot about it add columns from data table and i'm going to select the only data table that we have Boop. and you can see it has um it's auto filled them um, I was about to go and do all of this stuff manually and we now we just have a button for it. It's amazing um, because it's such a common use case that people want to use, want to just display data from a data grid. Um, and if there was some sensitive data in here, like some last time somebody logged in that we might not want to make public, um, we could always just remove that column and that wouldn't remove the functionality that we've just added in. Um, cool. So one thing that's interesting about the data grid or the way that the data grid functions is it's this sort of, it's, it's a grid and it has um, this structure where we've, we've got all these columns, but like with a database, you might have multiple rows within that. And the way that a data grid functions is it gives us this data grid component. And then within that, it uses um, a sort of a secondary form that gets repeated for every single row of data that that data grid wants to display. We'll see this in action a little bit later. And that's called a row template. We don't need to mess with that just yet. We will in a bit. Um, cool, okay. So we have built out our data grid and we've set it up to display the kind of data that we have stored in our data table. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna set it this, this form up so that when it loads in its, uh, yeah, when, whenever we see this form, um, I'm just going to make these uh, columns a little bit more nicely spaced. Uh, we want to give we want to give priority to the feedback. So I think that's where the most information, where the biggest sort of display thing is going to be. Um, we're going to go to the code of this form, and in its initialization, in its init, um, we are going to write some code so that when this form opens, it pulls that data from the database and displays it to us. And the way that we do that is we actually access that repeating panel um, within the data grid. So if you look at all the different things that we have in this autocomplete, um, we can see that there's a repeating panel and that repeating panel belongs to the data grid. That repeating panel is um, a component that just, um, you feed it an iterator and it consumes items from that iterator, displays them until the iterator is empty. So we're gonna set, and the way we feed it an iterator is we set its items property. Um, and in order to get the things that we want to, it to eat up and display, we call that server function. So we do that with anvil server call get feedback. And we don't need to give it any positional arguments because get feedback, the server function takes no inputs. So that's a little bit convoluted. Um, we'll see a bit more of some of the, the things I've mentioned in passing in a moment. Um, and please do shout if, uh, if there's anything that people would like clarification on. Um, cool. For now, let's go back to our app and I'm gonna go and see what feedback has been given. Um, and you can see that that, that has worked. We've, um, we've pulled successfully pulled feedback from our database and displayed it in this data grid. And I'm gonna mess around with the spacing of these columns because the timestamp is way too wide. Uh, one thing that I would like to point out is that this timestamp is not very human readable. It's a bit ugly. That is the result of just calling um, the str function, like casting to a string, a timestamp object. Um, so we'd like to make that a little bit more user-friendly if possible. Um, and the way that we're gonna do that is we're gonna go back to, we're now in form two. We're just looking at the code. I'm gonna go back to the design. And what I'd like to do is I would like to edit what happens in here. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, if you folks can see my mouse when I'm doing this, but I'm, I'm gesturing at the, the timestamp column. We want to change how that gets displayed. And the way we can do that is we're gonna double click on this and it takes us to that row template that I mentioned earlier. Um, and here it's displaying it in context. You can see up here, it's um, it said form two row template one. It's displaying that empty template in context so we can see what's actually going on. Um, and all we want to do is we want to edit how the timestamp is formatted when it's displayed to a user. And the way that we can do that is we're going to drag a label component over onto that timestamp and drop it. And what we can do is a really cool thing. There's um, data bindings. 
And so this form, this, this row template, is what gets called, it's what gets populated by each item in that repeating panel items. This is being populated by a single row of our data table. And what we can do is we can bind, so the data that is bound to that cell is the timestamp of that row of our database. Um, or rather we can set it to be that. So all we've done so far is exactly what existed before. Um, we've just replicated the behavior by saying, I want this to display my timestamp. But what we can now do is this here, this self item timestamp, that's a Python object. Um, specifically, it's a, it's a timestamp, it's, it's a timestamp object, um, which means we can call um, string format time on it um, here, in, here in the UI. And I am going to copy my handy dandy uh, date time format string because I can never remember any of the arguments, um, any of the things. Um, sent. So I'm doing hours and minutes um, on, what is this? The, that's the day of the week is percent A, percent lower D is the date of the, the number in the month. Um, capital B is the month of the year, and then capital Y is the year. Um, so this is just like string formats. You can go and look up. I always have the reference open when I have to do this live. Um, but what we're doing here is we are binding this Python object to the text property of this label that is living within this form. And before it is bound to that text, we are calling a, a format function on it that just is native to that Python object. So we're actually using Python code directly here in the UI. Um, and we'll see what the result of this is. So if I just do that and I'm just gonna click out of here um, and go back to my form. And you can see here, it's actually changed so that all of these are instances of label one because we, we didn't give it a fancy name, it's just label one. But crucially, when we go and reload the app, I'm gonna go and see my feedback. Um, you can see that's a much more human friendly representation of the timestamp object. Um, and that's one of the things about the sort of the core philosophies of Anvil is that it's not a no code tool. It is a, it's and it's not a low code tool. Um, we like code specifically. We like Python very much. And we think that people should be able to use Python for all bits of the web. Um, and if you know how to format a date stamp in Python, you should be able to use that to make your timestamps look nice. Um, cool. So um, this is a really common pattern for people who build with Anvil, this, um, this pulling in a data grid and setting it up to display data from a data table. Um, you can see, obviously, there's a squillion uses for that. You might have any kind of CRUD app, um, create, read, update, delete, where you just want to display lots of data that you have and maybe enable people to click on it and edit it or so on and so forth. Um, so that's a really like the reason that this data table, this data grid object exists in Anvil and the reason that we added that button to just to add rows from the data table, add, add format from the data table, um, is because it's just such a common use case. Cool. Um, all right. Um, so the next thing that we're going to do, and we are kind of getting away from this as a, a feedback form, and we're moving more into just kind of showing off things that Anvil can do. So, you know, bear that in mind, this is not, you know, we're getting into things that would be a bit silly to do for a feedback form. Um, I'm going to add user management to this app. I want people to only be able to um, go and see their feedback um, if they are logged in. Only people who have an account with this app should be able to see the feedback. I wanna protect it so that I, I know that only people who I trust can see this feedback. So I'm gonna add the user service and this is extremely cool. Um, and we can see on the left here, it just lives under this little icon. Um, and this is how, if you're writing an app that you want people to be able to have accounts and data specific to them, so on and so forth, this is how you do it. Um, and we've got lots of different ways that people might be able to sign up for our, to be, have an account with our app. We've got classic email and password. We've got various integrations like Facebook, Microsoft Azure. Um, you can sign in with Google and I'm gonna enable that because it's just super easy. In fact, I'm going to mandate that that is the only way people can log into this app is if they're signed in with Google. Um, and We've got some also, there's other options like you can add 2FA and you can remember login between sessions. 
Um, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to allow visitors to sign up and I'm going to make sure they don't have to confirm their email address before they can log in because I'm lazy and this is for display purposes. <laughs> um, cool. One thing that, about the user service is if we go back to our data, we now have an extra database and this is a database of all the user accounts that are currently active for our app. And at the moment there are none, but we've got things like what are their email is the user account enabled and you can configure it so that I, the app owner have to go in and check that button before people can start using their accounts. So um, when were they last logged in, password hash, so on and so forth. None of that's relevant because I've made it be only Google. Um, and that's by default sits under app table users. Um, right, so, so far we've added user management. We aren't actually using that anywhere. There's nowhere in our code that we're calling anything to do with this. Um, what we're going to do is we want form two where we display our feedback to be gated behind a user login. And all that we do in order to make that happen is we go to our form two, I'm gonna collapse this down because I don't need it right now. And we're gonna go to the code. And when we initialize this form, when, it, when it's displayed to, to the users, you can see that here by adding the user service, we've added this line into the automatic imports at the top of the form, um, Anvil users. Before this, um, this server call happens, I want to force people to log in. And the way that we do that is we call Anvil users login with form. Um, and that means what that, I'll show you what happens when, because of that. Here's our form. You can still you can still enter and submit feedback without being logged in. But if I go to see feedback, um, it'll say you need to sign in. Um, and can I sign up for a new account? It will ask me to sign in with Google. And um, OAuth has happened, uh, or OpenID Connect has happened, and now I have a user account linked to my email address. It's worth noting that just because I'm the person who owned that owns this app doesn't mean I have an account by default. I could maintain this app without being an active user of it. Those two things are not actually the same. But now that I've logged in and have been able to see feedback, we can go back to our users, our data table, which contains our users. And if I refresh that, you can see that now um, there's a row for me in this, in this database saying that Eli at Anvil.Works is a user of this app. They last logged in at two past seven. Um, there we go. Um, and anybody who accesses that app um, can, can create an account for themselves. I didn't have to check this tick box to make sure that they were enabled, although I could have for extra security. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of different things you can do now that your users, you have user management, you can um, set permissions. So for example, maybe there's um, a way to email, maybe you hide um, the email accounts behind an extra layer of permissions. Like you have to be an admin user of this app in order to see people's emails or so on and so forth. Um, but that is that. Um, there's, there's loads of really, like this, this user service is really like extensible and very, very cool. Um, but uh, you know, with a, with, a, with a very minimal amount of code and a very minimal amount of having to know, understand the complexities of what's going on when you log in with Google, we've enabled that for an app, which is quite cool. Um, Right, this is pretty much the last thing, is adding a PDF. So I have all of this feedback. I would like to be able to download a PDF so I can print it out and stick it on my wall and look at all the nice things that people have said about whatever it is I'm asking feedback on. Um, so again, not necessarily something you might actually want for a feedback form, but um, it's, it's, it's cool that you can do it. So what I would like to do is this form two, that. This, this form too, I'd just like that actually as a PDF. I'd like to download a PDF and have it look like this. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're going to write a function to generate a PDF for us. That will live in our server code and go back to our server module. It will be um, perhaps unsurprisingly, another uh, client callable function. So we add our little decorator and we'll serve a callable and I'm going to call it create PDF. Um, oh. And it doesn't actually need any inputs again. Um, what I need to do before I do this is I need to import Anvil PDF. Um, and that's just Anvil's PDF management uh, module package. Um, 
and in order to make the thing happen I do this I call anvil.pdf.render form and what this function does is it takes a form and it turns it into a pdf it's really really simple and the form that I want to render is the form is form 2 because that's our displaying feedback form and all I want to do with that is I want to return it. I could do this in one line, but I'm never quite sure. Uh, like with this function, um, it's like it's better to probably do it in two lines. Um, this one can throw errors. So um, cool. Very, very simple two line function. Um, what we want to do next is we want a way to download this PDF. And I'm going to go to form two. And I'm going to add a button. And when we click this button, we are going to be able to download that PDF. I'm going to put it at the bottom. New button. Um, what am I going to call it? Uh, I think it's still just button one. Cool. Um, I'm going to add some text. Download PDF. And I like the primary color role. So I'm going to set it to that. Purely aesthetic. And we want this button to do something. We scroll all the way down to its events and we add a click event handler. And we've gone to our code. Um, and all I want to do is um, download this PDF. So I get the PDF by calling that um, server function. And again, this one doesn't take any input. So that's all we need to do. And I need to import Anvil Media because what the PDF that we've now created is, is it's a media object. And we want to an, um, import the Anvil's media handling library, um, which isn't included in the default imports. If I'd imported it twice, obviously it's no big deal because that's how Python is. And what I want to do in this button function is I just want to download that PDF. Cool. Um, so let's see what happens if I do that. I go back to my app. Uh, I go to see that feedback. It logs me in, it, or it checks that I'm logged in, lets me see it. And if I download this PDF, it will, um, it should. There we go. It's created that PDF. You can see I've downloaded it. And if I open it, there's that form um, just as a PDF. Now, it's actually not that great so far because what's happening here is it's just printing the form as is it's still got this thing called give feedback and it looks like you can click on it but if you click on it nothing happens and same with the button and we don't want all of that um moreover this data grid if it had enough rows it what would happen is um that you would be able to use these buttons these um these arrows on the left on the right here um to scroll through obviously that won't work in a pdf so what we want is we want the behavior of that form two to change depending on whether or not it's being printed as a PDF. Uh, and we can do that. We can add conditional formatting into our form. So the way that we do that is um, we go and we change what happens when this form, form two, starts. And the way that we do that is we're going to add um, a variable into its init function. So um, I'm going to add a bool here and we're going to um, default it to false. So, so far, having done this changes absolutely nothing about this way this form behaves. Um, and what we do is when, in order to set this to true, to say, yes, this is being printed as a PDF, please do something different. Um, when we call that render form uh, method in our server function, so that's here and create PDF we can pass in true. And passing this in as a positional variable to this function um, causes it to go to be read as the input for PDF in form two's init. And what that means is if form two was initialized by calling that server function, this variable will be true. If it's initialized by, looking, uh, by clicking the link in the other form or by viewing it on the web in whatever other way, that variable will be false which means that what we can do is set some properties to be different in that case. So for example, we can say, if it's a PDF, let's do something different. Um, I want that link in the top that says, take me back to the giving, the, the first form, I want that to go away. 
So self link uh, link one. Um, I want that to be invisible. So we set its visible property to false. Um, I also want that button to go away. And that was just button one and exactly the same. I set its visibility to false. And what else we can do is, so when I mentioned that if we had enough data, then that data grid would add um, pagination. It would, it would have multiple pages that you could click between. And obviously that won't work in a PDF. We can edit the data. We can um, change the, the, sorry, we can change the behavior of the data grid to just arbitrarily display infinite, in theory, amounts of data, as much data as we have. And the way that we do that is we go to the data grid. There we go. And it has a property called rows per page. Um, and you can set this to whatever number you like. If we set it to none, it disables that page, that paging behavior. And it means that it will just print out as much data as we have. And that's the behavior that we want for a PDF, right? We might end up with a PDF with like 10,000 pages if we've got a lot of feedback, but you know, um, obviously you could write a lot more complicated logic to handle that case if you were expecting that amount of data. But for now, that's what we want. Um, the default is 20 um, for numbers of rows before it starts to give you multiple pages. Um, cool. Um, all right, let's go and see what happens now that we have made those changes. If I go and see the feedback again, and I download that PDF, it'll give me a new one. That looks a lot better. We've got rid of that link in the top right. We've got rid of that button and um, the, the arrows are still there, but if we had more than 20 rows of data, it would be displaying all of them. So uh, adding conditional formatting into our web form to make it be a nicer PDF. Um, cool, uh, any, any questions before we move on to the, the very last and pretty short um, section? All right, let's go on. Um, so the last thing is uh, adding HTTP endpoints to an app. Um, so in this case, uh, what we want to do is I would quite like to be able to query feedback from the command line. I love the command line. I'm a sysadmin. I live on the command line, let's say. I have this app, but I don't like downloading PDFs. That's for people who like the front end. I want it all in my terminal. Um, I want to just be able to curl an endpoint and have it on my, on my terminal. Uh, we can do that. And the way that we do that is it's a server code. It's server code things. Um, Anvil has built-in support for adding HTTP endpoints. And the way that we do that is we add a server function and we add a decorator to it. That means that that function gets called whenever anyone hits that endpoint. Whenever, one, whenever anyone does an HTTP get on a certain URL, this function is what will be run by our app server in that situation. And the way that we do that is we add a decorator and it's not Anvil server callable, it's Anvil server HTTP endpoint. And what we do is we can add um, a path. And you can see at the bottom, this yellow little pop up here, or this yellow bar says, this is how I can access this endpoint. And I'm just gonna copy that, uh, that URL. Um, and this is telling us the format of the HTTP endpoints provided by this app. So you can see we've got the apps URL here, and then an underscore, slash API, and then whatever path I've put in as um, a variable, as an input to this decorator. So API slash feedback is how we're gonna make this function run. Um, there we go. And I'm gonna say def return feedback via HTTP, doesn't need any inputs. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loop over all the feedback that we have on our data table. And that's gonna be returned to via the endpoint in JSON format, which is a pretty common way of serializing, for example, Python objects. One complication with this is that date uh, timestamp objects in Python do not correspond directly to a data type in JSON. So we're gonna, we can't just dump the data tables out into, into um, an HTTP response. We're gonna need to do a bit of, um, Conversion serializing, essentially. Um, it's really simple. So all we do is we're going to return a list. Oh, that's not what I wanted at all. Um, we're going to return a list. And in that list, 
we're going to have objects that look like this. They're going to have a name. And we're, what we're doing is we're looping over all the rows in. Um, it's not auto completing for me because it doesn't like my syntax. Hang on. There we go. Add a number there so it makes it happy. Um, we're just going to do exactly the same thing we did before to get all of the data in our data table. It's just a blank. It's just a blank search. So what this does is this is going to iterate over all of the rows in our um, our data table, and it's going to spit them out to us with the variable name R each in turn. So actually, what I want to do is I want to access the name from that row, and all that I do in order to do that is like it's a, it's like a dict object, it's a dictionary object. Um, it's, it's not, it's a row object, but it has a dictionary-like API so that we can access its, um, its data using square brackets. Cool. And the email is exactly the same. Um, email. Um, now the timestamp is a little bit tricky, as I mentioned. This is the reason we can't just return the results of doing that search that that data table get, um, sorry, that data table search, it's because we have to call the str function on the timestamp because what we're getting out when we extract the timestamp from this data row is a timestamp object which cannot be di directly passed into JSON. We have to turn it into a string first, um, which is annoying, but hey ho. Um, and then the feedback is just a string when we get it from the data table, so we can just get it from our data row. Cool. So what this function is doing is it is going to return us um, a list of dict objects that we have extracted and formatted from our data table. Um, and I'm not actually going to do it from the terminal for all that I talked about doing it from the terminal. I am actually going to go and visit this URL in my browser. So if I go back to my app, I'm actually going to go underscore API slash feedback. Um, and you can see it has it's doing that. It's it's returning a list of those those rows. Um, and if I did this in my terminal, it would be passing me passing me those just as as JSON objects, um, or rather string. It, it would be giving me this output in my terminal. Um, so that's a nice way to you know if you've got various systems that want to inject or extract or query data over HTTP APIs, super simple. Um, all right, that is uh, the end of the schedule the, of, of um, this, this PDF um, that I have, handed down to PDF. And um, I think we've taken a pretty comprehensive look at what you can do with Anvil to build a web app questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. If anybody has questions, um, wants to know more, would like help with things, um, I would love to help out.